Hey everybody. Today we're going to use the chi-square distribution to test for independence between a couple of categorical variables. So here we're basically looking at two-way tables, or contingency tables as they're sometimes called. We've got a categorical variable going left and right, another one going up and down, and in the individual cells we're going to have counts for the number of observations that fall into any particular combination of categories. On the right and bottom, I've added a column and a row of marginal totals. That is the total for the entire row and the total for the entire column. Um, we're interested in the question of whether or not the two variables are independent or not. In other words, um, does knowing the outcome for one of the variables tell you anything about the outcome for the other? In this particular example, we're going to be looking at ages and preferences for pain relievers. So let's remember the definition of what it means probabilistically for two events to be independent. So two events are going to be independent if the probability of both of them happening is just the product of the individual probabilities. So when we talk about categorical variables being independent, we're talking about the probabilities of each particular combination of the outcomes of the different variables equaling the, the product of the individual probabilities. So we're going to do this the same way we always do with chi-squared. We're going to compute expected out numbers of outcomes, expected counts for each of the cells in this table, and compare them to what we actually got. The first issue that we run into is that we don't actually know the probabilities that individuals will have certain ages or will have certain preferences of pain relievers. We don't have any insight into the population, in other words. Um, so we'll do what we always do. We'll estimate these parameters with sample statistics. The way we're going to do it, for example, for ages, which we'll call the AI, is we're going to take the total number in our sample that fall into each age group and divide it by the total size of our sample. So for example, 18 to 29, we have 33 of them. So we're going to estimate the probability of someone being between 18 and 29 as 33 over 200. Um, we'll do that for each of the rows, and then we'll do it for each of the columns as well. And here we're lab labeling the pain reliever categories as the BJ. Okay, so notice that we're estimating um, the, the number of parameters that we're estimating is the number of rows, um, one for each row, and then one for each column. However, if we know the probabilities for the first three columns, then we can compute the probability for the fourth column, similarly with the rows. So really we're only estimating h plus k minus 2 parameters, where h is the number of rows and k is the number of columns. All right, so let's get expected cell counts. The way we're going to get expected cell counts is by multiplying the probability that an individual falls into any particular cell, probability of AI intersect BJ, by the total sample size, so times n. If the null hypothesis is true, that probability factors as the probability of AI times the probability of BJ. And then we substitute in for those two probabilities um, what we, the expressions that we have for them, simplify a tiny bit, and we get the relatively simple expression um, that the expected cell count is the row total times the column total over the total sample size. OK, let's talk for just a second about degrees of freedom. We started with hk cells all together, h rows, k columns. So initially we have hk minus 1 degrees of freedom. But we estimated h plus k minus 2 parameters, so we're going to subtract out that many degrees of freedom. There's some simplification, and magically the number of degrees of freedom we end up using is 1 fewer than the number of rows times 1 fewer than the number of columns, h minus 1 times k minus 1. That's also relatively intuitive, I think. So actually computing the cell counts is kind of a pain in the butt. You take the row total times the column total, divide by the sample size, and you do that h times k times. So this time, in this case, 16 times. Um, and then once we have that, we can actually compute the chi-squared statistic. For every cell in that table, we do observed minus expected squared over the expected. We get all those values, we add them all up, and in this case we get about 4.6. We're going to do a chi-squared test. We want to know the probability of getting a chi-squared statistic at least that large in chi-squared of 9. Here 9 is 4 minus 1 times 4 minus 1, so 3 squared. 
in this case we get 0.87. That is not a small p-value. And so we conclude that our data is consistent with the null hypothesis that the two variables are independent. Okay, so let's acknowledge that this arithmetic was nasty. We had um, to do a lot of different calculations just to get the expected cell counts, and then actually computing the chi-squared st test statistic was a pain. Technology is recommended. In R, for example, the basic command is chi-squared.test, and you can feed it a table, matrix, or data frame of counts.